Hello, everyone, and Merry Christmas. I hope that this uh, the last few weeks have been wonderful for you, that you've been able to, to do your family traditions and, and be, be with those that you love and just enjoy the, the wonderful time of year. To me, it's, it's, it's my favorite. More people are talking about Jesus than they usually do. More people are thinking about Jesus than they usually do. And I think with that comes all of these good feelings. People give more, they're kinder, they, they want to help others. And the sad part is when, you know, on the 26th, we put him away, we put him back in the box, we, and we kind of go to a, a lonely, you know, a lonely dreary January sometimes because we forget about the Lord. So don't forget about the Lord this, this January. Hey, I wanted to, I, I want to share something with you that I, that I hope will be, that I hope will be helpful. I, I worry sometimes that our expectations of Christmas and our reality of Christmas, the holiday season can be, can, can cause us some, some disappointment, right? So we, we get excited around October, November for, for Christmas. And we start to think, oh, how wonderful it's going to be. And we start to set a, a pretty high expectation, right? We start to think to ourselves, this is going to be the best year. And sometimes our expectations meet our reality. And those, the, the difference between those two can cause us some pain. Let me give you some examples. So these, here's the expectation, right? That this beautiful picture where, you know, our, we've got our little baby under the tree and, and the lights are just shining and you got a little puppy there, right? This is really what happens, right? Children don't seem to care about photography as much as as much as parents do. You have this little baby here, right? All sound asleep. Look how just this is a perfect scene, right? But that's not reality. Reality is going to be something more, <laughs> something more like this. We we have our expectations, right? And we think, oh, this gift is going to be perfect, or oh, these lights are going to look perfect, and it always doesn't work out that way. We want things to be cute and wonderful. Mommy kisses Santa, but that's that's more more like what it ends up looking like, doesn't it? Sometimes we have a party in mind and we set a beautiful party and we have this idea of how perfect it's going to be and it ends up kind of looking like that, but not exactly. And then we try to, we think our family's going to get along, right? It's Christmas time. It's the holiday season. Our, our, our little kids are going to get along so well. And mostly that's just not a, <laughs> it's just, a, it's just, it's real, right? Life is, life is real. We, in our head, we, we build a snowman or we build some sort of Christmas idea in our head. And then we kind of look at our reality and, and we, we don't like it, right? When, when the reality is fun, it's fine, but it doesn't look like what we had in our head, right? This is what we have in our head. Look how beautiful and perfect this picture looks, but the reality we kind of hide down below, right? There's the reality of life. So when it comes to the joy of Christmas, will you just try to, to watch out for those for those expectations, right? We'll try to watch out that you're you're not getting bit by the expectations that you have of how wonderful it's going to be when we could really just enjoy our reality. I've heard it said that disappointment is the gap that exists between expectation and reality. And so maybe we can lower our expectations a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. And we can enjoy reality a little bit more. And that maybe that'll that'll close that disappointment gap. For us, I want to I want to show you. This is a, a some of you will remember if you're if you were born in the 1900s, you probably remember Elder Joseph B. Worthland. He said the first thing you can do is learn to laugh. That's really when it when it comes to facing disappointment, you, you need to learn to laugh. Have you ever seen an angry driver? He says who, when someone else makes a mistake, they react as though that person is insulted his honor, his family, his dog, and his ancestors all the way back to Adam. He says, or have you ever had an encounter with an overhanging cupboard door? So the cupboard door is left open, you come up under it, and it's at the wrong place and the wrong time. And then that cupboard door is cursed, condemned, and avenged, right? You grab it and slam it shut as if the cupboard door is like, whoa, sorry, I'll never do that again by the sore-headed victim. There is an antidote for times such as these. When, when, when you have a reality that doesn't meet your expectations, there is a, an antidote. Learn to laugh. Learn to laugh. He says, I remember one of, when one of our daughters went on a blind date. She was all dressed up and waiting for her date to arrive when the doorbell rang. In walked a man who seemed a little old, but she tried to be polite. 
So she was kind of disappointed in her blind date. We watched as she got into the car, but the car didn't move. Eventually, our daughter got out of the car and red-faced, embarrassed, ran back into the house. Why? He says the man that she thought was her blind date had actually come up to pick, had actually come to pick up another of our daughters who had, had agreed to be a babysitter for him and his wife. All right. So, <laughs> so she gets into the car thinking she's on a blind date. The man thinks he's just picked up the babysitter. And the expectation, <laughs> the two different expectations hit, and reality set in, right? This is what Elder Worthland said. He said, we all had a good laugh over that. In fact, we couldn't stop laughing. Later, when our daughter's real blind date showed up, I couldn't come out to meet her, meet him because I was still in the kitchen laughing. Now I realize that our daughter could have felt humiliated and embarrassed, and been upset and angry, right? But she laughed with us. Listen to that one more time. She laughed with us. And as a result, we still laugh about it today. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Proverbs 17. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. There's another a Bible version of this, another Bible translation, the Good News translation saying, being cheerful keeps you healthy. It is a slow death to be gloomy all the time. If you have a, a gloomy person in your family, you might just elbow them really quick if you're sitting next to them. It is a slow death to be gloomy all the time. I wanted to just share a story with you. This this Christmas, this 2021 Christmas is a little bit different for for me. This is going to be my first Christmas that I've, I my father is gone. So my father just passed away in March of this year, March of 2021. And so my expectations going into Christmas are a little bit different and the reality of Christmas and the reality of of life and death is is coming with me into this Christmas. So I wanted to share a story with you about my dad in, in hopes that one, it'll, it'll bless your life. And also two, that I can, um, it, in a way, have him with me this Christmas by sharing him on this Christmas fireside. If you've ever heard me speak before, if you, if you never have, I, I talk about my dad frequently. He was a professional golfer. And so I grew up in St. George, Utah, where there's a golf course on every corner. And one of those golf courses is a golf course called Southgate Golf Club. I used to play this golf course all the time with my dad. He he taught on the driving range there. He, he, he was a professional golf teacher. He was PGA teacher of the year a couple of times. And, you know, I would go over after school or on a Saturday, we would go golfing. And to me, golfing was just part of life. If that's your dad's career, right? That's what he did for a living. In fact, growing up, I, I didn't think it was weird that my dad played professional golf. I just thought everybody's dad played professional golf. I used to bring him for show and tell. I remember I, you know, we'd go out the third graders out to the field and he would, he would hit a golf ball and all the kids went, whoa. And then, you know, I, I felt super proud. So this was just really a part of my life. Well, if you can see the arrow here on the scorecard, I don't even know how they do scorecards anymore. They're probably all online. But back in the 1900s, this was, you know, you, you filled out your own scorecard with a pencil. You might have to explain to someone who was born after the year 2000 what a pencil is. But if you can see the little arrow there, I want to tell you a story about hole 15. You can see it's a long hole, one of the longest holes on the course. It's called a par five. Now, if you've never golfed before, golf, golf holes come in three basic in, in three forms, par three, meaning it should take you three shots to get the ball from the from the tee to the hole. Par four, which is pretty common, you, you could, it should take you four shots if you're a decent golfer to get the ball to the hole. Or par five, and they're usually the the long uh, the long holes where you've got you know 500 yards of grass between the tee box and the green, which is where you do the putting. So it should take you five shots. This was a, a par five and I'd played this par five before. It's an uphill, at least it was then, I don't know if they've changed it, but it was an uphill shot about 500, almost 600 yards. And I, I loved this hole just, I loved the idea of a par five because I could, I could usually get a birdie, right? If I, if I played it careful enough. And there was something different about the green of this hole. So this is a, this is a golf green. And you can see this is where, you know, you're trying to hit the ball with the golf clubs. If you've ever watched any golf at all, you're hitting golf with the golf clubs. And then when you get the ball here, you use what's called a putter. And the putter, you're going to try to sink, you know, just barely tap the ball. And you're going to try to roll it right into the, the what's called the cup, right? You're going to try to roll it into the, 
into the hole there. Now, when a golf professional sees a green, this is not what they see. They look at a green and you and I just see kind of well-cut grass, right? But a golf professional sees what's called the lay of the green or they read it, they read the green. So as you're looking at this green right here, right? This is what a golf professional would see. They would see all sort of of where the ball's going to fall, where's it's going to go? What, if I if I hit the ball this way, you know, is it going to go a couple of inches right, or is it going to go a couple inches left? You'll see golfers doing this. Here's some professional golfers trying to read the green. Can you see them? You've probably seen them do this before, where they they get behind the ball and they look at the green. Tiger Woods does this, right? Is he staring at the ball? If, if you didn't know that they were reading the green, you'd just be like, why are they? What are they trying to stare down the ball like? They're trying to intimidate the ball. No, they're, they're trying to get the lay of the green. This guy gets down really low. This guy just makes his caddy do it, right? He's taking a picture of him while his caddy gets down there. This is one of my favorite stances right here. I mean, this is really low. I don't know how he even does this. This is yoga reading of the green, or this guy looks like he's about to pounce <laughs> right on the ball. But what are they doing? They're trying to read the green. My dad would be amazed, I think. I never got a chance to talk to him about this, but there are now sunglasses that you can put on that supposedly help you read the green. And, and of course, apps that you can use to help you read the green. So you see how crucial this is to a golf professional? Because putting, you you hit for show, my dad would say, you, you drive for show. And if you're a golfer, you know what I'm going to say next. You drive for show and you putt for dough because that's where you win a golf tournament. You win on the short little putts, right? Because if, if you can putt well, you're going to win golf tournaments. All right. Well, here is the green I was on that day and I hit the ball right there. So you're, you're thinking to yourself, Hank, this is this should be an easy shot, right? But let me show you the read of the green. The read of the green is very difficult. I am heading straight down. So you can see the entire green is kind of leaning one direction, leaning forward. And my ball is right on this hill. So let me let me kind of show you how it might look from a side view, right? So there's a hill right there. I did all the graphics myself, thank you. There's a hill right between me and the cup. So it looks like this, here, here's basically, the three looks I can give you. So the one on the top left is a simple looking shot. You can see on the top right, oh no, there's a big hill between. And then you can kind of see the horizontal view, the look at it from the side of what that what that's gonna look like. Now, those of you who are golfers, who've spent any time golfing, you're looking at this trying to decide what to do. And I had my thoughts of what to do. Now I had played this hole many times and I kind of knew what was going to happen. I was going to try to tap the ball as gently as possible towards the hole. And the, what was going to happen was that ball was going to go straight towards the hole, but the hill would make it go so fast, it would jump the hole and go just roll all the way off the front of the green. And it happened to me over and over and over. And every time I tried this, I thought, oh no, right? I made it onto the green in, in three shots. This is going to be my birdie putt and I'm going to miss it because it's going to head right over the hole and it's going to head down, down the green. Well, this day I was playing with my dad and I came up to the, to the hole. My dad's a teacher by nature. He just always was teaching. And so he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to just hit it straight forward down, down the front. All right, here's my plan. I'm going to hit it straight forward and, and, you know, see what happens. And he said, what do you think's going to happen? And I said, well, it's probably going to, go too fast and go right over the top of the hole. And he said, that's exactly what's going to happen. Has it happened before? And I'm like, every time. And he said, all right, let's try something different. And he went and he walked to the other side of the green and he, he put himself right at the, right at the bottom edge right here. And he said, hit it this way. And I was like, that's totally away from the hole. <laughs> that's not going to work. And he said, no, 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 I, I think it's going to work, right? He, he, in his mind, he was seeing the, the, the layout, right? The, the one I showed you on the, the top right. This is what my dad was seeing. I saw the top left. He saw the top right. And so he said, yeah, I, I want you to come over and, and hit it this way. And I was like, that's not going to work. I mean, at least my way, I have a shot of making it, maybe, right? But your way, there's no way I'm going to make that shot. I'm going away from the hole pretty much. And he, we kind of went back and forth talking about it. And then I remember he, he stopped, he was smiling and he said, Hey kid, and I was like, what? 
And he said, who knows more about this game? Me or you? And even as a prideful, you know, 15 year old at the time, I, I said, you, obviously. And he's like, all right, trust me. I was like, okay, right? Because I knew my way wasn't going to work. I've tried it so many different times. It's not going to work. So I remember this. I I, I, I lined up uh, totally. Here's the, the, the hole. Those of you who've got before, I'm here to putt and the hole's in front of me. I'm not even putting the ball at the hole. So I line up and I take, he even told me, he said, here, he put a toe down and he said, just put the ball right at the edge of my toe if you can. And I was like, okay. So I hit the ball right towards his toe. Instead of hitting it at the hole, the cup, I hit it right at his toe. And I, I remember watching the ball as it kind of rode the edge of that hill. It rode the edge of that hill, rode the edge of that hill, about 15 feet over to him. And then right when it got to his toe, it turned down the hill. It turned down the hill and it started ahead right back towards the cup. And it was slowly just going forward, sinking, 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 or just slipping over, slipping over, slipping over. And I remember watching this ball, all of a sudden that I'd hit this direction was now going this direction. And it got closer and closer to the cup and I'm watching it. And I heard my dad in the sound of my, in, a, in my left ear, as I'm watching the ball, I could hear him. Oh, 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 and that ball got right to the edge of the cup and sat there for a second and then fell in the cup. And my dad and I both erupted in joy. I cannot tell you, all right, we erupted in joy. I wish you could be there. I wish it, it, when we all get to the celestial kingdom, when we all get to heaven, come ask me for the video because I'm hoping they have it on video because this would be in the sports sports center top 10 golf shots of all time. We both danced around hands in the air. We danced around the the green and my dad, professional golfer who'd you know seen a lot of golf shots. He said, that's the best putt I've ever seen in my life. And I was like, well, if it's that difficult, why did you have me do it? He's like, well, it's the only way I didn't think you were going to make it, but I knew it was going to be the only way you could have made it. Anyway, we, we danced around the cup and didn't want to leave. We honestly didn't want to leave that green because of that incredible moment we had had. We still, I was going to say, we still talk about it. We used to, to talk about it all the time. I'd say, you know, he'd go out golfing and I, of course I'd have to bring it up. Do you remember that? You know, do you remember that putt I made? And he's like, oh yeah, 15 on Southgate. Never forget it. Greatest, greatest golf putt I've ever seen in my life. Now, like I told you, my, my father passed away this last March and I was frustrated as many of you have been when, when someone passes away. Of course, I know the gospel plan and I know where he is. And I, I know, you know, that he is still very much alive and having, I'm sure, supernal experiences, but I was frustrated and, um, and I, I sat kind of by myself, you know, of course, the days after his his passing. And and I kind of looked up to heaven as in like, oh, you know, I, I, I could have used some more years with my dad. He was 77. So, I mean, he lived a, a long life, but I was hoping he'd live longer. And I was, I was kind of frustrated. And I, I thought about this moment. And in I heard the Holy Ghost say to me something to the effect of, I think what the Lord would say, which is, Hank, who knows more about this, me or you? And even my prideful 43-year-old self, you know, says you, obviously. All right, so trust me. Trust me. This is this is good. This is the what you need to be. This is what needs to happen. And I remember that golf shot where my dad said, trust me. I know more about this game than you do. And so my testimony for you this Christmas is if you're going through something difficult, something hard, and, and most of us are, that we need to trust him. And he, he knows more about this life than we do. It's it, Trust him. Even though it doesn't seem like we're heading in the right direction, we are. We are. So I'll finish with this. We find the real joy of Christmas when we make the Savior, not our problems, when we make our the Savior the focus of the season. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.